NAD and NAD precursors like NMN and NR have become really popular in the longevity space and also in the health optimization space overall, which is why it's been really interesting to see this recent paper that's come out that shows some potential cardiovascular risk in association with taking niacin. So in this video, I'm gonna dive into that recent paper and talk about some of the nuance and actually go into the details. So recently this paper has come out and it's been going around social media a fair bit on niacin and potential cardiovascular risk and adverse events. So I thought I'd weigh in and put my two cents after doing a bit of reading on the paper itself and actually looking at what some other people in the space have been talking about. Uh, I'll give kudos to Chris Masterjohn because he's done a really good article which I'll actually link in the show notes. I highly recommend you read it, but I'll take a few notes from that and share with you guys here. So if you haven't uh, seen the paper that's been going around lately, it's this one here, Terminal Metabolite of Niacin Promotes Vascular Inflammation and Contributes to Cardiovascular Disease. Now what they found in this paper was that those in the highest quartile of these two specific metabolites of niacin, 2PY and 4PY, which we'll cover what those are, they had a increased three-year risk of a major adverse cardiovascular event. And this was in two separate cohorts, both European and US. So, Pretty well done study and they looked at quite a bit. But let's get into the details and see a little bit more about niacin because for those of you in the longevity space and in the health space, you've probably seen niacin or NAD, things like NMN and NR and they're sort of all the rage right now. But this paper potentially shines some light um, showing us that maybe we don't want to be dosing super physiological amounts of niacin and we want to keep it within reason. And again, Chris Masterjohn, who I'll give credit to, has put in some recommendations there. So let's look at this a little bit more. So niacin is a really important molecule. Often you know it as B3. Niacin is needed for the production of NAD plus and NADPH. NAD plus is a major part where our body can utilize it to create energy and it's a major substrate for energy. And that's why a lot of people now are taking it. They you know you have the NAD IVs or like I said, you have the NMN and NR supplements. Now, one of the issues is with this pathway, you can have an excess if you have too much NAD or niacin, you can have an excess in uh, nicotinamide. And that nicotinamide often gets methylated and that's why people who are taking NR or NMN, it is often recommended that you take a methyl donor with that. So a lot of people and supplements now will have TMG in there, trimethylglycine, because that acts as a methyl donor to re, uh, it helps to resynthesize our methylation and rebuild those pathways. So it is very important if you're taking NR or NMN to actually make sure you're taking something like TMG to support that. So there's a couple pathways. So that um, nicotinamide is methylated and that is then excreted. There's also nicotinic acid or niacin that actually gets conjugated with glycine and then extreated. So there are aspects of taking excess niacin through supplementation or other means where it can deplete some of these things. So even that alone is already something we need to be mindful of. But this niacin can go down a particular pathway um, and we can see the pathways here are relatively complicated. But if we look at the NMN and NR, we can see that through NAMPT, we have nicotinamide that gets into NMN and that, and that goes into the pathway into NAD. Now that NAD can get used in various things. So we can see down here, NAD plus degradation, that then goes into the salvage pathway um, because it's been converted into uh, NAM often, and then it will go back into this, into NMN, and then it sort of circles all the way through. So this gives us an idea here of the actual NAD pathway. And obviously, if we've got too much of one, that can slow things down. Even NAD acts as a bit of a feedback loop. So it's a very tightly controlled system, and there are other pathways of actually generating some of this NAD through tryptophan, which we'll talk about as well, because that's what's really important for this pathway. But the important thing to look at is actually where some of this is getting broken down. And in the paper, they had a really good graphic here that you can see. We can see when there's excess niacin from this niacin pool, a lot of that will get converted into this 2PY and 4PY. And the issue with the specifically the 4PY is that it was shown to increase this uh, vascular adhesion molecule where then leukocytes can actually bind to the endothelium and then create inflammation in the endothelium. So that's then leading to vascular inflammation, which obviously leads to a cascade of issues which they suggest would lead to these increase in adverse events. So that's a specific reason why they're saying excess niacin may be problematic. It's particularly this 4PY molecule. And Chris Masterjohn had a really interesting 
theory here as to why the 4PY seems to be problematic and less so the 2PY and it's particular to the chemistry of it in that it's very similar to something like methyl glyoxal, um, which can cause a host of other issues. If you want to learn more about that, I recommend you read his article. I'm not going to get into too much there. But the important thing with this paper that they highlighted is looking at the tryptophan side of things. So as I said, tryptophan can also be converted into NAD via the kynurenine pathway. And we can see here as it leads all the way down quinolinic acid into NAMN and then into eventually NAD. Now, what they found often is that if the tryptophan is being utilized for energy and there's already enough NAD, it will actually get pushed down this other pathway via this enzyme here, ACMSD. And the problem is people who have a deficiency in this enzyme end up having their tryptophan pushed down the NAD pathway. And then that leads to an excess of NAD, which then leads to an increase in that 4PY conversion. And that's a metabolite that we don't want. And so they found a few polymorphisms. They looked at some of the genes and they found two genes or uh, SNPs specific to this enzyme ACMSD, um, which is, what does it stand for? And let's see if I get this right. Amino carboxy mucinate semi-aldehyde decarboxylase. So that enzyme, when there's a deficiency there, they found two specific polymorphisms, which you can look at um, in the paper itself. But they confirmed that it was actually this specific enzyme that was causing the dysfunction and the increase in 4PY by doing a follow-up mouse study. So what they did is add in silencing RNA, so what they're calling knockdown mice, onto this specific enzyme, which reduced its function, and then they measured the amount of 4PY in these particular mice against the wild type. And what they inevitably found was that these knockdown mice did have an increase in 4PY, which also led to the increase in that vascular adhesion molecule. So again, we have very clear mechanistic data to support the theory of why this is happening, eventually leading to that endothelial inflammation. So it's a really interesting paper, and again, it sheds a bit of light onto the potential downsides of excess niacin, especially in the days where a lot of people in the longevity space are doing super physiological doses. Now, Chris Mastajohn, again, he talked about a couple things, and for those that are familiar, niacin has actually been used in the past for cardiovascular health, specifically for reducing cholesterol. And there were early papers, sort of pre-statin times, where they actually found improvements in cardiovascular health. And that's because um, early studies showed that there was maybe some improvement in endothelial function, but the dosing was around 50 milligrams to 100 milligrams. But most of the research supported that it was actually reducing cholesterol, which was leading to the improvement in cardiovascular health. And of course, that's a whole topic that we can talk about in another video. Um, so there was some data to show potential benefits of niacin, but there's growing amount of data now that maybe the benefits were not actually that significant. And obviously now with the advent of statins, they say there's not really much use. And now this new data sheds light that there's maybe potentially some downsides to it. And Chris Masterjohn actually looked at a couple papers that were looking at NR and NMN to see how much 4PY was produced. And often there's a range of dosing there. Some people are taking quite low dosing, around 250 milligrams, but a lot of people, especially if they're following uh, David Sinclair, are dosing in the 1000 milligrams or gram and upwards. And what some of these studies found is that people that were dosing around that one gram uh, mark were actually getting marked increases in their 4PY. So again, this supports that super physiological dosing of niacin, whether it's NMN, NR, et cetera, may be problematic and may actually be counterintuitive to your longevity if it's increasing this endothelial inflammation. Because obviously, as this paper suggests, that may lead to increased potential for adverse outcomes. And of course, even with NAD and NMN and NR, there's still a little bit of controversy around the cancer side of things. Recently, some research is showing improvements in some types of cancer, um, but yet I think there's still more research that needs to be done. So overall, we definitely, based on this and some other research, we want to be mindful of not dosing too much with niacin and really focusing on getting our amounts from whole foods anyway. So a lot of the things we can get from either whole food sources or just low dose niacin often will be enough. And again, even for supporting NAD, there's things we can do that naturally boost our own NAD production. Things like exercise are going to be fantastic. 
staying lean and healthy and having a varied diet that's high in animal foods and organs can also help increase your natural production of NAD just via um, the niacin in that diet. And then of course the other thing with that is the tryptophan. So if you're getting enough tryptophan, as long as you don't have a deficiency in some of these pathways, you'll also be producing NAD through there. So there are a lot of ways your body can do this naturally, and it suggests that we probably don't want to be super physiological dosing nice and beyond the amounts. Chris Masterjohn says, based on some of the papers that he was looking at, he suggests maximum 250 milligrams, if that, and you may not even need that anyway. So really interesting study, definitely shed some light on the potential downsides of excess niacin, and I'll certainly take this into consideration with some of my longevity protocols and what I recommend for my clients. And I think one interesting thing that I'll probably do a follow-up video on is tying this into trigonelline, it's a hard one to say, um, because there's some growing literature around that and how that plays into the whole NAD and niacin pathway as well. And so I'll probably do a follow-up video on that one, and we'll pop it up later. Now, a couple downsides to this study um, that were brought to light is they didn't actually measure the amount of tryptophan or niacin that they were intaking in their diet, so we have to take that into consideration as well. They were really just focusing on exogenous dosing, but as we were looking at with some of these pathways, there's a lot of intricacies that are there, so we actually need to look at the whole pathway and the whole picture of how someone may be producing these 4PY metabolites. So key takeaways then, avoid super physiological doses of niacin. So if you are doing things like NAD IVs and taking high doses of NMN or NR, you may want to reconsider that, especially if you are young, you're under 45, you probably don't need that extra niacin or NAD in your system anyway, as you'll produce enough. Plus doing things like physical activity, you're going to produce your own. But if you are going to be dosing with anything, keep it around 250 milligrams based on what Chris Masterjohn says and see how you go with that. And as usual, of course, always make sure you're actually doing some of your own blood work. We can't measure 4PY clinically, but always keep up with measuring your cardiovascular risk markers. And that's going to give you the best indication of what's actually working for you. Don't just buy into the hype of marketing and different products. You actually want to make sure that we're doing things that are working and that are evidence-based and that we know that we have data to support. All right, that's it for this one. We'll see you guys in the next video.